Chat with Traders, episode 144, is supported by the fully licensed online broker TradeStation, who offer simplified pricing, ideal for active traders, a truly top-notch web and desktop platform, which supports automation, a mobile app, which has everything you need to monitor and trade markets while away from the desk, and all the other benefits you'd expect from an award-winning broker. To open an account, visit tradestation.com slash traders. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Traders, how you all doing? Now, I'm preparing this episode a couple weeks in advance because as this has been released, I will actually be away on holiday. I'm going to be in the Maldives for a few nights, channeling that Timothy Sykes lifestyle. You feel me? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I will be in the Maldives for a few nights, and I'll also be in Singapore for a few nights. So I'm just taking, uh, taking off for, I think it's about 10 nights with my girlfriend. Uh, it'll be nice to kind of switch off for a little bit. The last couple trips I've been on have obviously been trading related uh, and related to the podcast, etc. Anyway, on with the show, I have a fresh episode for you that quite possibly will introduce you to a new type of trading strategy, one you mightn't have heard of. My guest is proprietary trader Tim Steenstrup, someone who I actually met briefly while I was in New York City, uh, Tim came out to the event. We've had a few emails back and forth over the past kind of few months. And Tim's also a listener, a uh, long time listener of the podcast, which is very cool. So since 2013, Tim has been a cross-border arbitrage trader at Conventus Capital. But markets have been a part of his life going right back to 1994. Tim's been a part of a brokerage firm in Japan, a hedge fund, which was actually featured in the big short movie and trading firm. During this episode, we skim through Tim's backstory and then spend a large part of the episode going into the mechanics of how a cross-border arbitrage strategy works. Tim does mention that this type of strategy can be difficult to implement as a retail trader, but regardless, I think it's good for you to hear about the various approaches of how professional traders are trading the markets. It's also quite interesting to hear how Tim's used insights from previous roles and experiences to shape his trading strategy of today. Like in some ways, it's almost no surprise that he's wound up trading this particular type of strategy. It seems like it's something which is well suited to him given his background. Tim also makes some helpful comments about taking and recovering from losses throughout the episode too. I hope you will enjoy this episode and learn a few new things. Here is Tim Steenstrup for episode 144. Just for starters, Tim, how many years have you been trading now? I've been trading since, well, I've been in the market since 1994 and I've been on the proprietary trading side since 2004 and really been truly my own proprietary book since 2007. So it's kind of a combination. All right. Well, let's wind the clock back to around 1994. How come you got involved in, in financial markets? Like what attracted you to, to all of this? Right. I'd always been a risk taker. I always enjoyed risk when I was growing up. I was, you know, played a lot of poker, which is kind of the typical MO and, um, you know, gambled a little bit when I was in high school and, you know, I loved risk, but after college, um, my family definitely had the course for me to go to law school. It's a much more conservative course. So I graduated from college upstate New York, went to New York city, interned at a law firm, took my law school exams. Um, I did pretty well, but I wasn't really thrilled with the career choice. So I decided to defer applying to law school for a year. And I thought I'd travel the world. And at the time, Japan was, you know, a very powerful force in the world. They had bought Rockefeller Center. They had, um, you know, they were very, you know, they were just a huge player in the world in the early 90s and late 80s. 
So I basically moved to Japan in 1991. I thought I'd travel the world. And I started with Japan. And um, one thing led to another while I was there. Uh, I was just kind of having fun for a year or two. And while I was there, I met some guys who were working in the markets. And they asked me to interview at a brokerage firm. So um, I came in for the interview. I loved the environment. Um, I thought it was super exciting. And they needed basically Western guys um, in Tokyo to cover U.S. and European accounts out of Tokyo. And these were accounts that were coming into Japan to try and buy U.S. bonds, Japanese government bonds and things like that. So that was actually my first stop in the financial markets. And I did that for a few years. And um, I liked the environment, but I was not a decision maker. I was kind of helping other people buy bonds, which, you know, there was a lot of excitement to it. And you saw a lot of money moving around, but I wasn't the guy making the decision. I always wanted to be a decision maker. But I stayed on this path for a while because it was very secure. So I had good accounts and I was moving back and forth between Tokyo and New York. And, um, you know, it was an exciting business. Eventually, I was working in Tokyo and I kept trying to get back onto the proprietary trading side. And one of my accounts was um, a very famous place called Front Point Partners, and which, was, which became famous in that movie, The Big Short. And they needed a trader for their growing Japan fund. I got a job with them. Um, they were situated in Greenwich, Connecticut at the time. And I was kind of trading very late hours out of Greenwich. And then I was trading late hours out of New York. So I was basically trading Japan until, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning in New York City. And I was part of, a, you know, it was quite a big hedge fund. It became a billion dollar fund after a while. And it was fairly successful. But I was not really a decision maker there. I was reporting to my boss and he was making most of the decisions. So still, although I was part of you know, a really good hedge fund environment. I was learning a ton and I was learning a ton about risk and how to do the job. I wasn't the guy in control and I really wanted to be the guy in control. Um, and eventually we parted ways in um, 2007. And that's when I really became a proprietary trader. I got a job at a firm called, which is one, which at the time was one of the larger proprietary trading firms probably in the world. And I, you know, I know you've had guys on the podcast before that have talked about proprietary trading firms, but um, you know, the basic dynamics of these firms can vary a lot. And this one basically, um, you know, they gave you they gave you some capital to trade and they levered it up quite a bit. So and then you would make a percentage of whatever profits or losses that you made with the firm. So I joined there and it was a very rocky start because coming from Fund Point which had been a billion dollar fund where we were kind of running these long short portfolios in Japanese equities. Um, you can't trade that way when you go to a prop firm. You have to um, manage risk much more quickly. Proprietary firms really don't allow losses to continue for long. So when you're at a hedge fund, you can like short a stock and you can hope for some catalyst to come in the stock after a few months. And um, if it goes against you by 10%, that's okay because you've got this huge capital base to maintain losses. But when you're at a prop firm, you can't do that. And uh, you kind of have to cut losses very quickly. And it was a very painful first few months for me. And I had to learn that lesson. And I got into a hole very quickly. I lost, I think I'd lost about 60 or $70,000. And they called me in and they were like, you know, what are you doing? You know, you need to manage risk better. So I decided to go back and reread some of the books that I'd read in my early days in finance which in the biggest one that I reread was Market Wizards by Schwager, who you've had on your podcast. And when I reread the book as a prop trader, it was so different from reading it as a non-prop trader because, you know, obviously everything related to me much more thoroughly. And basically a lot of the prop traders in there talked about managing risk over and over and how they were preparing for the great crash of 1987. And this really sort of, you know, ringing bells in my head. I'm like, okay, you know, let's manage risk a lot better. So I completely changed my strategy and I moved on to a much quicker strategy of um, more or less, I took a delta neutral strat strategy for a while. So I was shorting one stock versus buying another stock. And that strategy was really good in 2007 and 2008 because volatility was picking up and in a higher volatility environment, sort of a delta neutral strategy like that really works pretty well. And the other thing that I did was 
I really um, got into a new type of trading called um, cross-border trading or um, ADR arbitrage. So do you want me to go through how, what, what that whole strategy is? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely keen to speak with you about that strategy. Just before we go that far, though, let's backtrack just a little bit. I want to talk to you about those first few months at, you know, you said you lost about $60,000 within the first few months there because your strategy just wasn't working out. How did you come up with this new strategy? Like, where did that come from? You said you described it as a delta neutral strategy. Like, how did you come up with that? So what happened was I went, uh, it was really a, a, you know, a big moment for me. Because I was like, do I, can I, ha- can I hack this? You know, and I went back and I read Schwager's book, Market Wizards. And it just the light bulbs, the light bulbs started going off like crazy as I reread it. And I was like, if you really read the book carefully, you know, there's a several of them that talk about the 87 crash and how they were, how they were treating markets going into the 87 crash and how they were all managing risk. And I hadn't been doing any of the things that they were talking about in the book. And I said, well, let me start doing these things. And the, what the, the strategy that came most clear to me was trading delta neutral. And I just said, well, I might make less money trading delta neutral because you always got one long versus one short in terms of dollar amount. Looking back, maybe I was a little naive, but it just, it just clicked. And at the time, the only delta neutral, neutral strategies are only going to work if volatility is decent because you're looking for dislocations in your stocks and to be able to take advantage of them. And if there's no volatility those dislocations won't really happen much so that was it i just I, I just that was like the first strategy i tried with delta neutral and then i combined that with this cross-border trading and it just worked really well okay well let's speak a bit about this strategy because this is still the strategy you're trading to this day right yeah i trade it still to this day although not as much you need you need vol to trade that strategy so although i still do it it's um you know you have to be much more selective about it but yeah, why don't we go through um, how it works anyway? Yeah, yeah. Break it down for us. Explain the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So I was living in Japan. I decided to do it with Japanese stocks. And there were other guys that were already doing this, but they had never lived in Japan. Um, they were just kind of using their own market knowledge to trade these to trade the strategy. So the most obvious way to talk, look at this is um, there's a lot of stocks that trade on different exchanges around the world. Um, and a lot of those stocks are fungible between exchanges. And the obvious example is a stock like Sony. Sony trades, um, in Tokyo under the ticker 6758 in Japan. It also trades in New York under the ticker SNE. You can buy SNE in New York, do a foreign exchange transaction, um, where you would sell yen at the same time. And then you would, um, sell six, seven, five, eight in Japan. And if you have a broker that will help you, you can collapse that trade into one. So, you know, the most obvious thing is, let's say Sony reports earnings after the close in Tokyo. Um, and they're bad numbers, for example. And then uh, the Sony shares in New York, say they drop 3% in New York because, you know, all the markets and all the algorithmic traders are reacting to the bad numbers in New York, so they drop in 3% below the Tokyo close. So if I think that 3% is too much of a drop, I can come in and buy SE in New York, do an FX transaction where I sell yen, and then hopefully um, 6758 in Japan will open above 3%, less also the transaction fees. And that strategy, you know, works in high volatility when people aren't pricing things correctly. Um, so that was basically the type of strategy that I started to get into in 2007. Let's break that down a little further. The first thing you mentioned, which I have a question around, is you said you do an FX transaction uh, to, to trade the overseas product. I mean, what do you mean by do an FX transaction? So you have to collapse. So when you're buying s e in New York, the s e in New York is trading in dollars. And the 6758 shares in Japan are trading in yen. So to lock in the arbitrage, it's not really an arbitrage, but to lock in the, the arbitrage between the two markets, you have to do an FX because you're locking in the price of SNE versus 6758. And, you know, the yen could move, you know, if the yen moves a percent or 
while you have the transaction on and you haven't done your FX, you'll be making or losing money depending on how the yen moves. So you have to do, there's three, there's three transaction to every one of these cross border trades. There's the trade you do in the US, there's the foreign exchange transaction, and there's the trade you do overseas. You do three things. So when you do this FX transaction, what does that what does that mean? You're actually buying, so you're actually trading the FX markets as well. So you're trading US dollar versus yen. Yeah, you have to you have to do an FX. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. It's a hedging transaction, but yeah, you're actually. So let's say that I buy S and E and sell six seven five eight. Then I am uh, I need to sell yen. Okay, so I need to buy dollars and sell yen overseas. And if I'm doing the opposite, if I'm um, if I'm selling S and E and buying six, seven, five, eight, I need to buy yen. So you have to do, you know, whatever the amount of yen that you're selling or buying, you have to, you have to, you know, do an FX on that transaction or else you haven't locked in your arbitrage. And that would be standard for any, you know, cross border arbitrage. When you're going between countries, there's always going to be a foreign exchange. Even if it's merger arb between countries, you're always going to do a foreign exchange to hedge out your risk. So is that the only reason why you're trading the underlying currency as well is to hedge? Yes. Yes. I'm not taking a view on the underlying currency at all in general. I mean, we do occasionally, but that's not really the game. Okay. So there is a chance. I mean, that part of the trade, like that particular transaction, you could actually lose money and reduce profit on your trade from that. But you're, you're doing this as a stock transaction. I mean, you're thinking to yourself, I'm here to trade the arbitrage on the equity, not the not the FX. And they, very often they go hand in hand, you know, because when the Japanese yen is um, weakening, that's generally good for Japanese stocks. So, you know, this is all very combined with each other. But still, there's only a few hours. There's usually only a few hours between the New York close and the Tokyo open. So you're usually just getting minor movements in the yen and you've just you're just kind of locking in the stock price. So, but, but you got to remember in 2007, I was doing this mostly on a Delta neutral basis. So I actually wasn't doing a lot of yen transactions because if I was buying SNE, I was shorting some other Japanese name against it. So I actually, they would cancel each other out and I wouldn't actually have to do a yen transaction in those cases. But in general, you do have to do that. Right. And you said uh, when you were first describing the strategy as well that sometimes or depending, your broker might actually be able to help you out with this. I mean, is that a common thing or do you need a specialized broker for this type No, of- yeah, it, it's very you, – you really have to be at a fund to do this strategy in my opinion unless there's a retail broker that's willing to do this that, to help you through because you can't collapse the trade without someone actually – funging those the, the 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 u.s share versus the foreign share like you can't just do it naturally you know, like a retail trader can't just go out there and do the strategy it's very difficult now that's not to say it's completely impossible but it's you know it takes a lot of legwork um i had a friend who was very experienced in this strategy working at a fund and he tried to do it on his own and he couldn't he said it was just too he couldn't find anyone to collapse the trade for him that's not to say it can't be done i mean it's just saying it's i, I just think it would be difficult you also said when you were first describing the strategy that if you think the, st- the the stock has dropped too much or gone up too much, how do you define what too much is? Yeah, well, that's you know that's the nature that that's that's where experience comes in and how you think the stock is going to react. So I do a lot of work, you know, looking at the news and understanding the numbers and looking at how the stock has reacted before to similar news. So earnings are the most obvious catalyst to move these stocks because they happen every quarter and, you know, they can move quite violently on earnings. And a very typical thing that happens is, um, let's say Sony again comes out with numbers after the bell in, in Japan and um, it drops uh, 3% in New York. Um, and I think the numbers are horrendous. Okay. I think they're much worse. I think, I think Sony will open, um, you know, I, I think the market's going to react much more negatively. So I might short Sony in New York and try to cover it in Japan at a much lower price. Um, but I have to really study the numbers and just see if that's justified. But very often what happens when you get a big discount on the screens, a lot of the algorithms or other traders that aren't as experienced come in and they'll buy 
you know, the bigger discount because they just see a big discounted number and they just come in and start buying it kind of blindly. Um, so you just got to be aware. And those are the kind of trades that I look for pretty regularly. And it doesn't always work. Believe me, I'm, you know, I can be very wrong at times too. I mean, if I, if I guess wrong or if, or if the market is missed or, or if some news comes out after New York closes, the whole thing could reverse very quickly. Sony could have, you know, a conference call, you know, before Japan opens and say, well, you know, we made a mistake when that was ordered in the numbers, or they could say our sales of this product were much stronger than, than we thought. And the whole thing could turn around. So there is a, there is a lot of risk in these trades. I think what might be helpful for not only myself, but everyone listening to this podcast, just to get some better context around how the strategy actually works is maybe if you could give us another example. So here we've talked about the Sony, uh, Example. I mean, can you walk us through maybe a recent trade that's uh, worked out? Um, what has worked out recently? Or not worked out? <laughs> well, we can go through what have I done very recently that has been good. You know, there have been a lot of good trades recently in um, – see, the thing is these trades aren't as exciting. But, um, you know, wh- why don't we go back to the financial crisis for a second when things were really starting to blow out? And every day you'd come in and U.S. futures would be down two, three percent. And what was happening, these we call the ADRs, which is the American depository receipts of the Japanese stocks, were moving wildly because hedge funds had to dump, you know, massive positions or, you know, it, it was just these huge dislocations were occurring. And um, there were huge profits to be made and losses to be had. At the time, so you know, one of the biggest trades I did in those days was I, I think I think we came in futures were down about three percent, and I looked at um, some high beta names like there was a high beta name which was or a higher beta name which was Honda, which trades in New York and Japan, and a low beta name which was um, NTT, which also trades in both markets, and they were both trading at about the same level, which was down like four percent in New York, something like that. And so what I did was I shorted Honda and I bought NTT thinking that the defensive name NTT would far outperform Honda when Japan opened because markets were so volatile. And um, sure enough, when Japan opened, Honda fell dramatically. It was a huge fall. It was something like 15 percent and NTT only fell like a couple percent. So that was like, you know, a very typical kind of great trade that worked in those days, I had a couple disasters with this strategy two years ago. Nintendo, which is a stock that everyone knows, um, came out with news after the Japanese closed that they were going to move into the um, mobile gaming business. Nintendo jumped uh, in New York. It had jumped up over 30 percent, which was above the limit that it could go in Tokyo. It was kind of crazy. And I thought it was just much too much. So I started shorting it in New York, thinking I'd be able to buy it back, you know, up 20% or something in Japan. But when Japan opened that night, Nintendo went right to its max upper limit and barely traded. And I was kind of caught short. And the next day I had to cover in New York and it rose another, rose like another 30% in New York. So it was a huge loss. But that's also happened on the good side a couple times, too, where you catch, you know, some stock will come out with earnings, like a couple of times Honda's come out with earnings and the market has just completely misinterpreted them. You know, you have the chance to short it in New York and buy it back in Tokyo when it drops much more. So, you know, it kind of cuts both ways. Okay. So why, how come these trades turn into really big losses just because of how fast the price was moving and the, the gaps on the open? Yes. Yes. I mean, I had, I, I had underestimated that like the Nintendo trade, I had underestimated the magnitude of how much, you know, how underowned Nintendo was in Japan and how many fund managers didn't own it. And they saw this as their catalyst to get into the stock and they just bought it like crazy. And plus there were a lot of guys who were short the stock. So was, there was a bit of a short squeeze on. That's what happened. It was brutal. You know, one thing you have to learn in trading is how to accept these losses and accept that losses are part of, you know, your strategy and the trading business. And you just kind of have to roll roll with them and move forward. 
Yeah. And I know throughout your career, you've had a few really big losses uh, somewhere around the dollar mark. I mean, was that one of those? Oh, yeah, that was one of those. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so how do you move forward from that point? Like, what do you do the next day when you show up at work? Well, I have to say I've handled it differently over the years. After that loss, I was just, I was, <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had planned a vacation the next day. So we were off on vacation for two weeks um, and I was thinking about it on vacation, but it definitely got me down. Um, but after that, you know, you kind of have, you go through these phases when you take a big loss as to how to accept them and move on. And I think it's just a crucial part of training. And I kind of had you know, I, I kind of worked in my head that, you know, you just have to accept that these are part of the business. Um, and you move forward and then you start chipping away at the loss and you start, you know, hitting singles and doubles. And before you know it, you've suddenly made back everything that you lost and then some. And then you got, you know, you're back in your groove and then you're starting to hit much bigger shots and you're, you know, and you're seeing other trades that then you make, you know, huge money on other trade you make on another trade and um so you know it goes in phases so how long did it take you to recover from something like this i mean it's it was actually much quicker than i thought it took um i thought it was going to take a while but it just took me um the nintendo loss took me a few months um and i was kind of right back to where i'd been and um you know it just shows you you can't get too you can't get too down when these things happen you just got to fight through it yeah and i think that's really important to keep in the back of your mind like how quickly you can lose money like you lost uh over dollars on this particular trade within the space of what two or three days which took you then a few months to get back i mean i think that's pretty good that you were able to make that back in a few months but just shows like how quickly it can all be taken away from you as well yeah it can be taken away very quickly and it also be you know you can also (laughs) you know there are other times that you don't realize you can make it very quickly too You know, you, the one thing is if you get down about a loss, your brain is not ready to look at new opportunities. So you just have to switch your brain back, you know, just like an athlete, you know, who has a bad play, he has to turn it off or else he's going to make more bad plays in a row. So you just have to recover and get back in the game. You know, it's a good lesson for all life. This episode of Chat with Traders is supported by TradeStation. And if you're a frequent listener of Chat with Traders, then you already know I'm a great advocate of TradeStation. Simply because I think they're an ideal brokerage and technology solution for many of you who listen to this podcast as they continue to be for myself. See, if we look at TradeStation's simplified pricing plan, It's a really good example of this. $5 stock trades or one cent per share, $1.50 per futures contract, low cost rates on options, no software fees, free real-time data, and free access to several professional grade analysis tools. You can learn more about these cost savings and benefits at tradestation.com slash traders. I mean, you owe it to yourself to have the right broker and the right tools to optimize your trading. So visit tradestation.com slash traders and find out if you could be doing better. If you like what you see, then go ahead, open an account. Also supporting this show is Audible. With Audible, you have a truly unmatched selection of audiobooks at your fingertips, but also original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. So here's what I'd encourage you to do, presuming you've already listened to every Chat With Traders episode. In your mind, think about one book you've been meaning to pick up and read for the longest time. Then go to audible.com slash traders, sign up for a free 30-day trial and get it as an audiobook for free. You can listen to it anytime, anywhere from almost any device, including your iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon Fire tablets or Windows phone. And if you need any title recommendations, just hit me up on Twitter. I've got loads, so don't be shy. 
Uh, get yourself a free audiobook today with a 30 day trial using my special link, which is audible.com slash traders. Okay, just to spell that out A U D I B L E dot com slash traders. Can we talk about some of the factors which have contributed to some of your most profitable trades? You know, just sort of switching switching this around here. Yeah, I mean, definitely the most the most profitable I had been was during high volatility events or when I read the news really well um, and I understand that the market has misinterpreted the news. So, I mean, I, I definitely, so definitely during the crisis were, were some enormous trades and they were happening almost every day, you know, and recently, you know, the trades are a lot more boring. They're kind of like, they're just like things like what happened with Sony. Sony came out with numbers after the close one day and they were, ter they were terrible numbers and the market had only taken Sony down two or 3% and I shorted it and it ended up opening down something like 10%. Um, and these are the kind of trades that you know, are much more common and regular, these kind of volatility events, and they're happening. You know, what's happened now to this entire cross-border merger, this cross-border um, ADR arbitrage game is, you know, the algorithmic traders have really come in and, you know, on a normal day when there's no volatility, there's very little to do in these trades. Um, if there's not much news out, then the algos just come in and they, they, they have their algo based on where Nikkei futures are trading in Chicago and where S&P futures are and where dollar yen is. And they have an exact algorithm as to where these stocks are going to open. So, you know, it's a lot tougher now, but the volatility events are still there and the best events are still definitely during earnings season when, um, you know, when you can really get to locations and the algos don't really know how to trade those events very well. How much time would you say you spend reading the news and actually studying for these particular trading opportunities? Massive. Massive. I mean, I'm in the office usually around 7.15 and I'm just reading, you know, news nonstop. And I'm reading it during the day too. I'm just reading news nonstop. And to be honest with you, I enjoy it too. I mean, I, you know, I think the markets are a giant puzzle you know, where you have news coming in from around the world and you kind of want to gather it and see how it all fits together and how it will impact, especially the stocks that I trade. And I love that aspect of it. But yeah, you are reading, I mean, especially during earnings season, you know, I'm reading everything, you know, I'm reading analyst reports and I'm reading, you know, doing a lot of historical checks to see how the stock reacted last time at earnings. And, you know, you're doing a lot and, you know, but I really enjoy that aspect of this job. It's very, very challenging. And you're learning, you know, tons every day, not just about your own stocks, but about other sectors you know, that are going on and you're learning, you know, more and more every day. How does, you know, how, you know, when this U.S. stock does this, how does this Japanese counterpart that's in the same industry react? Um, so there's a lot of trades like that that are out there. And the more you learn about the markets, the more you learn how to take advantage of them. And how do you keep all this information together? Like, do you just store it all in your head or are you like, are you taking notes or like, do you have a, a sort of a process around this? Yeah, I mean, I come in in the morning, I have my pad out, you know, I, I basically put a line down the middle of the pad, good news on the right, bad news on the left, um, U.S. news up front in, Jap you know, in Japan or, the, or, you know, Hong Kong news and Australia news on the bottom. And I'm just, anything that I think is going to impact some of the stocks that I trade, I just jot it down and see how it all fits together when these stocks open and you start seeing, you know, what they're doing. Okay. And are there any news sources which I guess are a favorite of yours or you think are most credible? What news sources do you prefer to read from? Well, I mean, I trade off of Bloomberg. Um, so we, you know, everybody at our firm has Bloomberg terminals and, you know, we use those for trading and, you know, we pay for, you know, up to the second news. And I'm also, um, you know, I'm on Twitter. I don't tweet much, but I do follow, you know, a lot of people on Twitter, seeing what they're saying. And I'm also, I also get a couple of professional news services, stuff that's going to come very quickly. And I'm also, you know, hooked up with a lot of analysts. So, you know, we're seeing analyst reports flow in and, um, you know, looking for, for how news is going to, going to impact the stocks that I trade based on that too. And just a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned Australia. So this is a question I actually meant to ask you earlier. We've spoken a lot about the US and Japan. Do you trade this particular strategy or a strategy similar to this across other 
countries as well? I mean, either US versus Australia? Yeah, I trade. We used to trade Hong Kong. Occasionally, we trade a lot of these markets. Um, just Japan is the easiest to trade because the cost of trading in Japan is, is fairly low. Uh, we do trade Australia too. The problem with Australia is the biggest stock in Australia is BHP, and it's probably the most, it's probably the most arbitrage name in the world. So, you know, even if it, let's say in New York, BHP is at a 6% discount to Australia. It will often open almost exactly where it closed in New York, um, just because so many people are involved in it and they're kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if they all buy it, um, they're all selling it in, in Australia also. So it just kind of like, and their break even is always the same price. So that's what happens. It's much some of these markets are much much harder to trade than others, you know. But we have we have a guy in our firm who trades Europe. Um, we have um, a couple of guys trading Japan. We have, we have um, we have you know someone who specializes in India um, and you know Indonesia. So you know we are trading a few markets. How accurate is this statement that you want to look at places that fewer people are looking? Like, are there many people? I mean, out of everyone I've had on the podcast, I don't think anyone trades a strategy quite like this. So is this a strategy that's I mean, obviously, it's quite unique in many ways. Well, it's very interesting because it varies. The algorithms obviously make my job tougher on low volatility event days. However, when a volatility event does happen, I feel that I'm, you know, I like to think that I'm more knowledgeable about the stocks that I trade than a lot of the other people who are looking at these markets and trying to trade them. So I think they, you know, I tend to think that they're going to try and make a mistake Whereas, you know, I'm going to be more often correct than they are. So, you know, I don't fear more people coming into these into these types of markets. But, yeah, we are always looking for obviously I think every trader is looking for where there are opportunities. And there are usually more opportunities where, you know, it's not as conventional. Like I do trade a lot of pink sheet and um, OTC names in New York. And there's a lot of Japanese names that trade pink and OTC in New York that very few people trade. Um, because they're very difficult to trade. You need to go through a broker um, a lot of times and, you know, there's not a lot of liquidity and they take time to get these these stocks on. And you kind of have to, you know, you kind of have to finesse your way through that market and figure out where where those opportunities are. And it takes time and it's not easy to trade. So I, we do trade a lot of those. And, um, you know, so it's kind of it's kind of a mixed bag, whether whether it's good for more people to be in, you know, to do what I do or not. Can you speak a little bit more about that last comment about pink sheets and gray markets? What's that referring to? Sure. I mean, there's a lot. So I'll just give you like Nintendo is a prime example, although a little bit not a perfect example because it trades uh, as a five letter name, uh, which means it doesn't really trade on a proper exchange in New York. So and there's a lot of them like that. There's a bunch of Japanese stuff. Maybe you've heard, maybe you've heard of the big construction maker Komatsu, which is a um, competitor to Caterpillar. They also trade as a five letter name, um, in New York. So basically they're very, you know, they're not very liquid. They, you know, they trade wide bid offer spreads. Market makers are, you know, very involved in protecting themselves in those names. So really the only time you can get liquidity in those names is, um, if there's an account in New York that needs to sell or buy in pretty good size. Um, that's the only time you can really do those trades, but you, you know, you really have to know your stuff to get, to get involved there. So why do you get involved in those particular markets if that? Oh, because, you know, because I know these stocks, you know, I know, I know these stocks, these are big Japanese companies. They just happen to, for whatever reason, they've decided to not list on one of the top exchanges in New York that just, you know, the, the listing fees to, to trade OTC or pink in New York is, you know, in the U.S. markets is, you know, obviously much less, it's less restrictive for them. So that's why they, you know, that's one reason why they, they trade on, you know, on the less liquid exchanges. But for me, it's great because, you know, I know that, you know, there, there are no, you, it, there's very few algorithms trading those names, you know, so you can come in on just a regular day and sometimes you know, some of those stocks will be out of whack and you'll have a chance to take advantage of a dislocation. Now, why would a company want to list in multiple countries? Like, why do they do that? I think it's to gain exposure in those countries for the most part. You know, they want they want access to U.S. capital. So, 
you know, and they want access to use investors. And obviously they want their, you know, a lot of, you know, there are some U.S. funds that can only buy stock in U.S. dollar terms. So, you know, let's say there's a fund that can only buy U.S. dollars, but they want to own Sony. So they don't have to go to Japan and buy 6758. They can buy SNE in New York and stock, you know, and create a nice sized position in that if they want to. You know, that's one reason. But obviously, you know, all these companies are so tied to the U.S. Most of them do a lot of business in the U.S., not all. And they all want exposure to U.S. investors. And what sort of, you know, I know you, I guess you'd probably call yourself a, a discretionary trader, right? Yeah, I'm mean, definitely a proprietary trader, yeah. Yeah. Is there any aspect to this strategy which is, which you use quantitative modeling? Yeah, I mean, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, well, put it this way, you know, we're spitting out, you know, all these names are coming off of um, our Excel sheet on a daily basis. So, you know, we're, we're looking immediately to see what's sticking out, right? So, but I wouldn't say that we're really modeling it because there's just, you know, I'm only trading, I don't know, 50 names regularly. Um, so they're all just popping up on the Excel sheet and you can pretty easily see what's sticking out and what's not. You know, having said that, you know, we are, you know, we are moving into some, some gray, gray box kind of trading, doing other markets. Since I've been listening to your podcast, to be honest with you, I've kind of expanded into other markets and especially the US and options trading and we are working on a gray box to trade some of that. Okay. Well, let's speak a little bit about that and also want to speak to you about, you know, you said this strategy which we've been talking about for the last 30 minutes or, or however long is particularly good in high volatility markets. What do you do in low volatility markets? Like how do you how is most of your day spent? What sort of strategies do you trade when volatility is just simply not there? Yeah, well, when it's not there, there's, there's oftentimes if, if you're not in earnings season and you're not and there's no news coming out after the close in Japan and there's not much going on in the U.S., you know, there's not going to be much to do, to be honest with you. I mean, the algorithms have completely taken over at that point. Everything's priced basically perfectly. So, you're just, I mean, you're still scanning for ideas because, you know, it's one one part of this job is you still have to read everything because you don't know if you don't want to miss anything in case there's something out there other people haven't seen. So you're still doing just as much work, but it can be very, very slow on days like that for this particular strategy. But what's happened is since I started listening to your podcast, I started hearing, you know, other traders, you know, talk about trading U.S. markets, talk about trading options. And, you know, I started experimenting with that and expanding my horizons a little out of this out of the strategy that I had been doing, and it's been pretty successful. Options are, you know, a very interesting market for proprietary trading because they, um, you know, you know your downside risk the second that you that you put on an options trade, usually. So you can put an option spread. You know that your max loss is I don't know seven eight thousand um, dollars. You can't lose more than that, and so those kind of trades work work really well. I think for, you know, they kind of fit in with the, with the, with the type of trading that I do. Okay. So how are you using options though? Like, um, this is just for trading pretty much U S markets. Yeah, I'm doing it for U S but I've actually expanded into, I noticed that, um, you know, options do trade on some of these larger Japanese names in New York too. Like, you know, the Sonys, the Canons, the Hondas, the Toyotas, they all have options. So we started to trade options in those names now too, as an aside. But yeah, more typically we're trading um, straight U.S. stocks. We're looking for upcoming catalysts in the stocks. We're trying to see how, you know, um, the stock is going to react to those catalysts and, you know, more or less place bets, you know, via options, um, specifically option spreads on, you know, an upcoming catalyst in a name. So, um you know, especially during earnings season, you know, if we think Google earnings are going to be good, we might um, sell a put spread and earning, you, you know, uh, in Google into the number if we have some feeling that Google's going to be good. And then, you know, something like the put spread would expire worthless if we're right. But it's definitely newer to me. I mean, we are, you know, this has only been about a year doing this, but it's been relatively successful as we're, you know, as I'm getting more into it. So it's been good. It's been good to expand my horizons and adapt you know, especially for the times when it is very low and very quiet with, you know, the main strategy of cross-border. How easy has it been for you to pick up on options? Like you haven't really traded them much in the past, like prior to a year ago. 
I mean, I knew, you know, I mean, I had traded, yeah, you know, I, I, I had sold them a little bit in the past. So you know, I basically knew them, but yeah, it took a little time, not that long. Once you, you know, once you play with it, start in very small size and just get a good feel for them. It took, t- I mean, it, it did take time, but once you understand that you can, you can do spreads and you know your max loss as soon as you put on the position, you can get very comfortable with them. At least that's what happened for me. And I was kind of ready for a new challenge in my trading journey. I really wanted to do something new and um, options were a great avenue for that. So how did you start learning more about them? I mean, did you just start getting your hands dirty, trading very small size or were there actually some good resources that were quite helpful? Yeah, I just, I really got, I mean, I already knew the basics to be honest with you. I, like I said, I broke them in the past. I, I kind of understood them, but I'd never really traded them as part of my proprietary trading book. Yeah. And I just started doing them in very small size and seeing how stocks reacted and seeing how it fit in with, you know, with my other strategies. And I just started doing them and just started growing in size and it, you know, it was working. I, I you know, I still can't say that it's my main strategy, but it's, it's a growing part of, you know, how I trade and, it's also expanded, you know, it's really expanded me much more into U.S. trading. And I've realized that, you know, reading much more about U.S. stocks has also helped me trade Japan because so many of the stocks are related to each other. Um, and it's, you know, increased my knowledge base pretty massively. Just generally speaking, are the characteristics between U.S. markets, like how they behave and how Japan markets behave, are they quite different or are they quite the opposite? I mean, I ask this question because I – interviewed uh Derek Wong on episode 97 and he's uh he's in China there and he was describing that the just the whole market behavior and how markets move what they're driven by is completely different to how markets are in the US or Australia and uh, that type of thing is does any of that stand true I don't think so I think it's I think the very yeah I, I don't think the market overall behaves that differently from the US except of course it's a different market and it's a much it's a much smaller market there's a much smaller universe of stocks in Japan to trade but you know and you kind of get a feel for when funds are going to gravitate you know you kind of get a feel for when funds are going to gravitate to the high beta names in Japan and you know the lesser tiered names in Japan and you know and, and those kind of things but it's not like China um, which can act you know you know, in a very different manner from Japan. Japan is a much more mature type of market. Now, as you mentioned earlier, this particular strategy is probably going to be quite difficult for someone uh, who's just trading independently to try and replicate. In saying that, though, how hard is it for someone outside of Japan to open an account to start trading Japan markets? I mean, well, to trade Japan, anyone, if you just wanted to trade Japan or just want to trade U.S., there's lots of brokers that will, well, not lots, but there's several brokers that will definitely trade both markets pretty easily. The problem is if you want to do that arbitrage type where you need to be able to do a foreign exchange transaction um, and you need to be able to collapse the arbitrage, you really, I, I don't think you can do it as a retail investor. Uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure, but it, it's very, very difficult to do. If you're just a retail guy who's starting up um, on his own, uh, you kind of need to be, you know, I, I work for a proprietary fund right now called Conventus Capital. And, um, you know, we're very, you know, we're very involved in this type of trading. Um, you know, we have a broker, you know, that will, you know, that, that helps us collapse these trades. So, you know, and I think you kind of need to work for, you know, a proprietary firm to get involved with that type of business, you know, and I would just say also, you know, anybody looking at proprietary firms should know they run the gamut. There are some of these proprietary trading firms that, you know, um, you know, some of them like mine really want the traders to do well. And, you know, their main purpose is that everyone's profitable, but then there's other types of firms where a big part of their business is just to, um, you know, make revenues off the trader by charging the trader commissions. You know, and I think a lot of your listeners should be aware, you know, that's that, that that's out there too. And, you know, so some firms might charge their traders a penny a share, you know, on every transaction that they do. And so the firm is making money whether the trader, you know, makes or loses money. 
Are there any things you would suggest that people maybe ask? Let's say they're going for an interview at a prop trading firm. Are there any questions you suggest they ask to try and make sure they get in with a, a good sort of firm? Yeah, just, you know, you want to ask what all the fees are that the firm is going to charge a trader. Like, you know, what, what do I, you know, what, what am I paying in commissions? What, what fees are you charging me on top of those commissions? You know, questions like that. Um, and they'll get a sense and you'll, you'll also get a sense pretty quickly when you're trading at a firm like that. If, you know, if you think you've made, I don't know, $10,000 your first month and your check comes in and it's only, uh, you know, $2,000 because there's fees, they've taken out fees galore and that kind of thing happens. So you just got to be somewhat careful and, you know, look for, look for a good firm. I mean, there's no getting around the fees, though, is there? I mean, they're just going to vary quite a lot. No, there is. No, some firms, some firms are much more. Some firms are, you know, really want their traders to succeed. The one that I work for absolutely does, and the, you know, fees are really, you know, minimal. Um, I have to say, there's a huge divergence. So you got to look. You got to look. Tim, is there any other final words you'd like to pass on, share to? aspiring traders, anyone who's coming up through the ranks, which you think might be helpful for them? No, I think, I think a lot of your traders say it on the podcast regularly, just, um, you know, understanding how to contain risk is, you know, the number one part of this business, understanding that losses are part of the business. And, you know, they're just, you know, every trader is going to have loss along the way. How you react to those losses is um, going to be vital in your trading career. You know, bouncing back from losses is huge. Be, you know, be creative have the ability to change how you trade when the markets dictate, you know, always, always try and learn new things. I mean, certainly for me, the desire to learn and challenge myself is a, is a big reason why, you know, I really love, uh, you know, trading and I love the markets and um, the freedom that it gives. Well said, Tim. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Um, if someone wants to, if someone wants to find out a bit more about you or, uh, I mean, I, I don't think you, Really, you don't have a website or anything like that. I know that for sure. You're on Twitter though. Uh, what's your Twitter handle? It's uh, just at T Steenstrup. Um, T S T E E N S T R U P. I don't tweet much, but I'm happy to uh, converse with anybody who contacts me. Excellent. All right, Tim. Well, once again, I appreciate you doing the podcast and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Aaron. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.